I'm going to chat a little bit with everybody about how to implement a community-based response. Um, and this is specifically based around our COVID-19 uh, current experiences. What I'm going to chat about today comes out of the Domestic Violence Community Protocols document that Sages and Impact released uh, last week, uh, towards the end of the week, and which is available on the Sages website under the COVID-19 response page, which you can find at the very top of the Sages website. So if you wanted to uh, take a minute, you could grab that document to kind of follow along. Um, I am mostly gonna go in order of that um, and just sort of walk through some of the information that's there, uh, talk through a little bit about um, what's there, why it's there, why we think it's important. Um, and then as Brielle said, we'll have a chance at the end for people to ask questions about any of the information that's contained in this. For ease, Carrie, I've put uh, the link to that page in the chat box if anyone wants to open it up and just click on it there. Wonderful. Thanks, Real. So to start with, before we talk about the community uh, protocols response, I want to take just a second to talk a little bit about the SAGES values. And the reason that I think that that's important is because I think that it helps to really root in um, both why we created the document that we did, um, how we created it in the time frame that we did, um, and the content that you're going to find within and, and the things that I'm going to talk about today and, and why we think those things are important. So it suggests these are the values that we carry as an organization in all of the work that we do um, all the time, whether we're in a public health crisis or not. Um, and so we really believe in the values of curiosity. Uh, we think it's really important to always be curious about uh, the world around us, the needs of others, the, the way that we impact, um, and the work that we do. We also engage um, in the value of courage. Um, and, and you'll see that as we talk throughout um, the, the protocols today, that a lot of the work that I think that we as domestic violence um, community organizations need to be engaging in right now um, is really about being courageous and stepping into uh, spaces that may not necessarily normally be the spaces that we're in, um, but in times like this, we have to be courageous in the space that we're in. Um, we engage in the process of vulnerability and uh, recognizing that these are incredibly vulnerable times. There is, we've never experienced something like this. When we think about experiences like the floods um, in Calgary or the fires in Fort McMurray, we think of experiences of uh, finite groups of people who are impacted. We think of clients who are impacted and service providers who are impacted, but the, the vast majority of Albertans were not impacted and therefore we were able to band together and to offer support and to offer um, assistance to those who were. And now we're looking at how do we support and how do we uh, engage in providing support and services for clients well, we ourselves as service providers are also experiencing incredible vulnerabilities. Um, and so how does that play out in all of the work that we do? And then of course, throughout all of this, uh, there's an incredible need to trust in the messiness. We have no answers to how long we will be engaging in these protocols, to what this looks like, what this will change moving forward for us, uh, to the impact around domestic violence, the increased amount of uh, experiences of domestic violence, the increased number of people that will be needing support as we move forward. Um, and so we need to be able to trust um, in the messiness that we are currently in. And I think that um, as we walk through, you'll really see how those Sages values have helped to sort of craft uh, the work that we've put together into creating the protocols and, and the, you know, the conversation we'll have today. So the first thing I want to talk about and, and that you'll see within the community protocol document is really this conversation around office closures and one of the things that I think is really important when we think about this is how do we best support both clients and staff needs so as service providers we often think about what is it that our that our clients need how do we best um, think about the needs of, of the clients that we are serving um, we also need to be able to address what is how do we keep our staff safe within these um, times, how do we ensure that we are um, not putting staff at undue risk or harm? So within a safety perspective, um, what can we do from a physical distance markers? Um, and I'm, I have been using the term of physical distancing versus social distancing because I think that helps us to be really clear about what we're encouraging. We're not encouraging um, a lack of social connection, we're encouraging a lack of physical connection. 
So within your office, if you are an office that is staying open, um, can you have physical distance markers up that really denote um, the spaces that are accessible for clients, that are accessible for staff, how to make sure that that is really clear for people so that they can feel comfortable when they come into your space, where they can go, how to participate in your office in a way that they feel safe when they're in that environment. Can you look at reducing your hours down so that there is less time that you may be open or accessible to the public or to clients? Or looking at changing those hours up. So um, we traditionally run um, with daytime hours. Maybe we need to be looking at adjustments with kids being home from school. Do we need to be looking at making an, an adjustment to hours to better meet the needs of when clients would be accessing our services? Should we be opening in the evening for an hour? Um, should we be opening at nap time? Should we be opening early in the morning? So looking at reducing or changing those hours. And then how are you looking at increasing your cleaning and disinfecting protocols? Do your staff know what those are? Are they well posted? Do your clients know what those are? Uh, so that they also can feel comfortable when they come into your space, that they know what you are doing in order to make that a safe space for them. And that really leads into this clear communication. Clients need to know what are your hours of operation, what are the changes to your programming, and what are the safety guidelines from AHS and protocols. So postings on all of your access doors, all of your um, social media, any of your communication points, so that clients can be, it can be really clear for clients to be able to say, we are open, but our hours are reduced. This is what you can expect when you come into our space. We want to be as clear and transparent with clients as possible about what they can expect when they come into our spaces if we are staying open. And I think the final consideration here is really why stay open. If you have a client base that is not primarily served out of your office, then I think that you can examine whether you need to stay open and you need to have someone that is there for clients. If you have a client base that does stop by, that you have emergency or crisis clients that come to your office space, you need to look at how can you best serve those clients and maybe looking at, is it your space that needs to stay open or do you need to have a sign on your door to say, we are not open, but our partner agency that is across the street is open and here are the hours that they're open for. So really looking at how do you work collaboratively to ensure that clients that are venturing out, if that's what they need in order to find safety, are able to make sure that they're finding somebody that is open and is accessible for them. The next section that is not currently found within the protocol document that I'm working on right now and will be adding is a section around virtual programming. So really looking at how do we transition the programs that we currently offer and our current model of practice, which we as social workers often believe is a model of practice that needs to be done and facilitated in person and to one that is now done online. What are the options available? One of the first things that I think that we need to consider within that is um, how do we look at privacy and confidentiality considerations? So before we can go virtual, we have to think about what are the implications for our clients? What are the implications within the um, accreditation bodies that we ourselves are registered within, that our programs are registered within, that our agencies are registered within? Are we aware of what those are? Are we aware of how they deal with virtual programming or virtual support? What are the safety considerations that we need to put in place for any clients who might be accessing virtual programming or virtual groups? What are the accessibility considerations? We talk a lot about um, internet. We've talked a lot in, in my um, in my group about internet as a thing that we used to believe was um, was a, a fun tool to have and now it is a necessity, uh, but not everyone has access to internet. 
Not everyone has access to computers, to webcams. So if we take all of our programming and put them into um, Zoom, does that mean that we're leaving people out? What options do we have available for phone calls, um, for text, for chat, that kind of thing? And then availability, also thinking about what is people's new normal? People are home, they're, they're not working, they have kids at home. When are people available to be able to engage programming? When would they be, when is a safe and accessible time for them? So again, possibly looking at changing up the hours that you would normally engage in programming, to have things that you're running early mornings, during nap times, later in the evening, after kids' bedtimes, that kind of thing. And then looking at and deciding what are the right platforms for you? Zoom, Skype, phone, text, chat. There's a number of different platforms. And you have to be examining what works best for your organization, for your staff, for your capacity. All of them have benefits and downfalls. And you have to look at what is, your, what is the best capacity for you, um, the best safety and security, what fits within your privacy and confidentiality uh, constraints, and fits within your budget as well. The other thing that I think is important for us to be thinking about at this point in time, and that really I think Sages has done a great job of uh, working with at this point, is engaging volunteers. We have seen at Sages a huge increase of volunteer engagement because we have a number of people who are not working right now and want to be contributing and want to be supporting. So while we might be tempted to take all programs like volunteer programs and put a hold to them so that we can be dealing with crisis and, and delivering crisis services, I would encourage people to think about how can we utilize all of those volunteers, all of those people who are engaged, who want to be offering help and support um, and have a time to be able to do that is there a way that we can be engaging with them? Is there a way that we can be prepping them so that also when we are not in this situation anymore, they're available and ready to go to be offering services, supports, programs, um, and, and that sort of thing. Because we have them, they're eager, they have nowhere else to go and nothing else to do, so how can we keep them engaged and active? The other thing that I think is important for us to think about as we practice physical distancing and as we practice um, self-isolation is how do we continue to keep our community engagement? And how do we continue to recognize our roles as community organizations and as community leaders in helping people to feel really grounded and safe and comfortable during these these unpredictable times. People look to us to, to be able to gain information about what's happening, to be able to gauge how to respond and how to um, engage in the communities around us. And I think that while the way that we serve the communities around us has changed and our ability to gather community together into a space has changed, those communities themselves has not. And I think it's important for us to recognize um, that that has not changed and that we have a very important role in helping to address issues of misinformation, of fear, of anxiety, of rumors. We can have active roles in providing, while we, while we don't have answers to be able to provide, I think we as community organizations can have active roles in providing hope and in providing connection, um, even through simple things like social media connection points um, and positive hope messages um, and, and connection through the communities uh, that we have served before to allow them to continue to feel like they are a united community, even if they're not able to do that together in one room uh, like they would have done before. Safety planning, of course, um, is always an important uh, element of any of the work that we do as DV organizations. 
And especially in times like this, where we're working with um, individuals who are possibly um, being forced to um, self-isolate or to quarantine with someone who is um, an abuser um, or who is using abuse. And so I think that when we think about safety planning within our communities, I think it's important for us to think about what are the enhanced pieces that we need to add and we need to recognize in our safety planning protocols. We need to look at how people who are using abuse are using the virus as a mechanism for continuing to um, use and um, uh, exert power and control over the people around them. Um, for example, to um, restrict access to cleaning um, materials, to um, provide misinformation about the virus and the community protocols and what um, people should or should not be doing, to disregard social distancing protocols for children or for anyone else in their community, um, to not uh, follow the AHS guidelines, anything like that. And so part of what we should be doing when we're doing safety planning is talking with people about how do we help them um, to understand how those tactics might be used against them and to build plans around how they're dealing with that, both if they are quarantining with someone who is using abuse and if they are um, separated from someone and have children who are going back and forth. And that's been talked about um, in the family violence and COVID sessions that IMPACT has done, um, which is another section that's in the community protocol document, which I'm not going to cover at all today because we've done those, um, those workshops with Wayne Barkowskis. And the notes section, the notes are available um, also on the SAGES website. It's important also, um, always, but especially in times like this, to be really clear with our clients and really clear for our communities um, what supports are available. So knowing within your community who is open, who is available, who in your community is, um, has, is still seeing clients in person, who is not seeing clients in person, who is seeing clients virtually, what hours are they doing that, has that changed, who is seeing clients, um, who has moved their clients, their programming to a virtual platform, who has changed what they're offering and not offering, um, who is partnering together, that sort of thing. So staying really connected with the services in your organization and in your community so that clients don't have to phone around to many different places to try to figure out what's going on, but they can make that one phone call to you and say, here's what I'm looking for, and you can be able to act as that conduit of information to them, to be able to say, I know that this is what's happening here, this is what's happening here, and we can make this phone call at three o'clock because there's gonna be a staff person available um, at that time for you. Um, and then of course, always having access to that 24 hour support. Um, so the family violence line, um, which is available. I know that in um, Calgary and area, that the connect line that is run by Quest has just added email and text support um, as well, which gives options for people who um, are isolated with abusers and unable to use phone or make phone calls at the time. We know that 80% of people who are experiencing abuse uh, talk to informal supporters, to friends, to family, before they ever call and talk to us. And I'm sure that that number is not gonna change at a time like this, and that we're gonna to continue to see that people are gonna be reaching out to those around them, even if they can't do that um, physically, that they're gonna to continue to be accessing the support of the supporters. And so now more than ever is a time that I think we need to be really addressing, how are we supporting all of those informal supporters who are um, providing uh, that safe space for people um, who are experiencing violence. And so we also need to recognize that as our world becomes smaller and we become, um, we only have limited places that we can go, we also then have limited 
opportunities for intervention and limited opportunities um, to be able to see and witness violence that's happening. So while we may be able to now see and witness things that are happening um, at our neighbor in a way that we didn't see before, um, we, we are lim going to limited places. So we are only actually accessing health professionals, grocery or pharmacy staff, um, and then those people that we see from our physical house, um, and then the people that we choose to engage with. And so we need to be looking at how do we encourage those limited people that we are accessing to continue to screen for domestic violence. Um, and so I've shared here the real acronym that CJS uses, which is to recognize domestic violence, to empathize with the person who's experiencing, to ask what they need and how we can help them, and to listen for what they, what they need for support. So this is where I'll do a shameless plug for Sages. So Sages has our Real Talk program has moved fully online um, and we are doing virtual sessions um, open to the public two times a week. Um, so anyone is available to, is, that wants to, can sign up to do one of those sessions and you can find all of that information on our website. Um, and then the other thing that I think we need to do is we really need to think about how are we going to support all of those supporters who are doing all of that work. Because just like we need to be supporting all of our staff who are also going through this crisis at the same time, um, we need to recognize that all of those supporters who are supporting their friend and their family member are also isolated and are also dealing with the economic impacts of this. Um, and all of the other impacts of what's happening right now during this health pandemic. And so CJS is also launching our standby program, which is a peer program for informal supporters to be able to be supported through their experience. Um, and that's going to be happening once a week on Wednesday nights. Um, and also you can find the information online about that. It is so important at a time like this that we stay connected as community providers, that we recognize that if we uh, separate into our silos, that is so easy. I know, I, I feel it myself. I am so busy. I sit at my desk every day. I put my head down. I look up, I go, oh my God, it's noon and I haven't eaten anything and I haven't done anything other than just sit here and work. Um, and it's so easy to just get caught up into our silos of work. And I think that one of the things that is the most important is that we figure out ways to stay connected to each other, um, to learn from each other, to implement ideas from each other, um, and to uh, not lose that opportunity um, to be able to continue to work in community ourselves um, as we go through this crisis. And so IMPACT is working really hard on providing lots of opportunities to be able to stay connected. So doing all kinds of trainings like this, um, providing lots of information to different funders and stakeholders um, around the experience that's, that domestic violence organizations are having um, within the COVID crisis, um, leveraging all of our learning um, and all of the experiences, the themes, the patterns, all of that so that we can help to um, build capacity around the sector and around the province um, and sharing all of our social media um, and really looking at how do we build um, a province that is really well connected um, and able to respond really well to this issue. Um, and then finally, and I, I hope that we're not that far out from the future of when we'll be moving um, out of COVID um, and that we, it, the planet won't look like that when we're done. Um, but uh, I think that one of the things that's really important as we process through this time and as we um, engage in, in crisis response, whether we're crisis agencies or not, um, is that we don't lose sight of planning for the future, is that we don't um, lose sight of what will it mean for us um, when suddenly we are not um, isolated in our homes. We are not all working remotely. We are back to working um, together uh, in our office spaces. Um, we, uh, I know, speaking on behalf of CJS, when the floods hit Calgary in, in 2013, we had a 30% client increase um, that I kept waiting to see disappear that never did. 
Um, and so I think that one of the things that I think is really important is that we, um, we prep uh, now and we recognize now um, that the client increase that we're going to experience throughout um, most likely is not going to go away. And so how do we now build program readiness to address um, that increased client demand um, and, and the community needs that are going to come and that are going to continue? Um, that we continue to recruit and train volunteers. Uh, Sages is running a training session this weekend for over 12, over 15 volunteers, um, because we know that we're going to need all of those people um, now more than ever. And so, continuing to keep any initiatives that are forward-facing, forward-thinking, going. Um, if you can transition all of that to be virtual. That you continue figuring out ways to do fundraising and sponsorship, that you don't take your foot off the gas for those kinds of things. That you continue to work and inform the collective impact bodies, such as Impact, such as um, any of the other collective impact bodies that you are associated with, of what your agency's needs are, so that they can continue to represent and build all of those um, larger scale um, systems and plans around what those needs are. And that you really think about um, and plan for what your reintegration with your staff team is going to look like and how we're going to do that. We, um, you know, none of us had the opportunity to plan for what the separation um, was going to look like. We all just said, okay, everybody work from home. Um, but we have the opportunity now to be able to say, um, let's plan around what's that going to look like and feel like and how are we going to build capacity and safety for our team um, as we work back into um, being together in, in a safe space again.